Joining us now is Ali Gareb. He's an independent journalist covering the Middle East and national security. Ali, how are you? I'm well, thanks. It's great to be with you guys. Great to be talking with you. Um, thanks for joining us. So I want to kind of start off of the bat with uh, this notion that John Kerry uh, and other people have been kind of putting forward that that basically the vote on Syria amounts to a Munich moment. And it's kind of shocking, I have to say, to watch these this kind of resurgence of these large-scale kind of industrial-grade World War II analogies only 10 years after they were deployed uh, in the run-up to the invasion of Iraq. And it's also disappointing to see people like Kerry, who you would think in general probably do have a bit more kind of sophisticated views of this stuff, what what do you what what is to be gained by drawing that type of analogy, or is it just as kind of crude and stupid as it appears to be? Well, I mean, I think it's kind of a sign of desperation on the part of the uh, of the Obama administration in trying to convince Congress. You know, it's not their uh, push for the vote is not going well for them. A lot of the um, a lot of the, uh, 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 the, the, the two big whip counts I've seen out there, one from Think Progress and one from the Washington Post, don't really look great for the Obama administration. I mean, it's not a done deal, but uh, it's still definitely up in the air, and they're kind of pulling out every trick in the bag to try and convince Congress to, to go for this intervention. One of the funniest things about the appeal to the World War II analogies, though, is that the Congress, as a, the administration has been so insistent, and uh, so have the, uh, many of the war's advocates, uh, in 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 print, it's uh, it's it's advocates in the commentariat have been so insistent that the uh, that people who oppose the intervention shouldn't use analogies to Iraq or Afghanistan. And Obama even said in his press conference in Sweden the other day that uh, that this is not um, this is not Iraq or Afghanistan. And so it's like we, you know, those of us who are skeptical about, uh, skeptical about intervention can't use these two recent conflicts that plunged our country into 10-year-long costly wars, but the administration itself can feel free to deploy these seriously overwrought analogies to the run-up to World War II and American and European involvement there. I mean, it's just sort of absurd. Yeah, absolutely. And then, and then it also runs counter and contradicts the, the second thread of this here, which is really, you know, they've been very unclear about even Kerry got, I mean, Kerry got tripped up. I guess that that's not necessarily surprising, but he got kind of tripped up on the question of whether or not there would actually be a U.S. troop presence in Syria. Uh, and then at the same time, in order to gain this congressional support that you're talking about acquiring, which is proving very difficult for them, they're definitely uh, pushing the notion pretty strongly that this will be a limited enga uh, engagement and mainly take place and pri only take place uh, uh, through through air airstrikes. At the same time, if this is World War II <laughs> and this is analogous to an, a Munich moment, wouldn't that mean that every available option at the very least would be, you know, at least seriously considered and pursued? So I don't, I guess even on the level of like, what are they trying to communicate through that about what the actual stakes are here? Uh, yeah, I mean, like I said, it's just it, it just sort of smacks of desperation. Yeah. I don't think that they're that they're serious with that analogy, and as you point out, they can't be because if this is the Munich moment, then yeah, you know, the whole point of the Munich moment was that uh, the this whole meme about appeasement, which doesn't quite get the history right and doesn't understand the context of the Munich Agreement, which you know I agree failed miserably. But this whole meme of appeasement. What happened by at Warhawks, Munich, Ali? No, I'm just, I'm just kidding. Sorry. Go ahead. <laughs> yeah. Sorry. Yeah, uh, uh, yeah, exactly. You know, Matt Thus pointed out in his column that the whole Munich thing has gotten uh, has has become such a, a common meme in uh, in in hawkish talking points that it sort of lost all historical context. And you know, he pointed to that uh, that Chris Matthews interview you were just making reference to during the campaign um, during the '08 campaign when Matthews interviewed this right wing radio host. And kept saying what happened in Munich, and the right wing radio host just said it was appeasement, and clearly had no idea what the actual contours of the Munich Agreement were. Right, and uh, and you know that's that's gotten totally totally lost here. 
and it's it just become kind of a, sort of a buzzword. And, you know, when you have to resort to buzzwords in order to press a case for military action, like, you're not making a very strong case. What do you think the closest analogy is? Is it Iraq or is it, is it Bosnia? Is it, or is it not helpful to make an analogy like this to begin with? Well, you know, the thing is that there's no analogy that's, that's uh, perfectly, that, that fits perfectly the current situation. But the problem uh, with saying that we can't use analogies at all is that it discounts the fact that any past interventions might have lessons to look at before this intervention. And so I think it's kind of, it's kind of a piecemeal thing about, uh, about which, which lessons from which past interventions you want to apply. You know, Michael O'Hanlon, who's a pundit at the Brookings Institute, who I really don't agree with, he's a military analyst, I agree with him on very little, I applaud him because, you know, all these people are making the Kosovo analogy, and Michael O'Hanlon a few months ago made that analogy as a pro-war argument in the pages of the USA Today, and he said that setting up this kind of no-fly zone will require, as it did in Kosovo, somewhere around 20,000 boots on the ground. Right. And so that at least is like, uh, is, you know, employing the analogy and saying that, look, you know, for him the lesson was different than, than it would be for me, because he's saying... Obviously, it's a pro-intervention argument, and I am uh, quite skeptical about it. But at least he's making an intellectually honest analogy, and I applaud him for that. We should be looking at other situations and what happened and what worked and what didn't. And, uh, and, and especially, you know, the, the, the comparison I always draw with Iraq is that we need to have uh, a view of what our capabilities are and what our objectives are for those capabilities to accomplish. And perhaps most importantly, and this is one that I think that you know, the, your comment about how, uh, how Kerry opened the door to boots on the ground really speaks to this, is that uh, one of the lessons of Iraq was that you can't just make these open-ended military engagements and that you need to have some kind of exit strategy or off-ramp for the U.S. before it gets involved. And, you know, war doesn't always go to plan. In fact, it rarely does. But that doesn't mean that critics of intervention should be given a free pass in offering up at least some idea of how we're going to get into this situation and extricate ourselves from it. And that was the lesson of Iraq and Afghanistan, these two wars that we spent a decade in. Absolutely. Um, so, so moving beyond the, the sort of never-ending resilience, it seems, of, of kind of disingenuous arguments for foreign intervention in Washington, it, it seems to me that there's kind of two tracks um, for examining a strike on Syria. And, it, and it, it, it seems to come down in two ways. One is that the more minimal or smaller option, what type of impact could that really have in terms of fundamentally altering the dynamics of what's happening there? And then the second uh, argument, and this is, these are both efficacy arguments, would be that you know the type of broader engagement that it might take to really change an outcome there could lead to all of these really serious side consequences and unplanned scenarios that you were highlighting. Is, is that the kind of basic problem with going into Syria? Yeah, you know, it was, it was really interesting to watch the congressional um, back and forth with the administration about this, because the administration offered a draft authorization for the use of military force to the Congress that was quite open-ended and left open the possibilities to uh, even a potentially really broad, uh, unlimited time frame intervention to uh, deter Assad from from using chemical weapons, and uh, and then the Congress returned one that was much more limited in scope, and you know basically was very careful only to authorize these initial limited strikes. Right. And then Kerry kind of conceded yesterday that. So look, if, if you guys want to just authorize a limited thing and we need to come back to you for further steps, that's okay by us. And it's been, you know, this is, this is why it was so important uh, for Obama to go to Congress on this. You know, I don't think he went necessarily out of, out of fealty to the Constitution, which presents its own problems considering he's a constitutional scholar. But I think he moved to the Congress because the U.K. had taken its vote yep. to not uh, participate in the intervention and as a result, that left Obama with his only allies as France and, and Turkey that were, that were vocally backing a U.S. intervention. And even, the, uh, the, even the, the Arab countries, Saudi Arabia and its Gulf allies and the GCC and the Arab League, would not make 
public statements in support of a U.S. intervention. They were just too cautious about it, probably perceiving that their publics would think that they were that vocally backing uh, a U.S. intervention in the Middle East was was kind of unsavory. And so, you know, have, and NATO itself said that it would not participate in this intervention. And so there was basically zero international or domestic legitimacy to a strike. And I think it was that uh, situation that led Obama to Congress. That said, I think it was a really good decision exactly because it's exposed these sort of debates. We're, we're actually getting um, lots of detail that we didn't previously have, even in the unclassified sessions, about uh, what the administration's plan is, uh, how robust it plan, how robustly it plans to intervene there, and uh, what it plans to do in the aftermath, what it hopes to accomplish. These are all things that we've only heard the administration speak directly to in detail since it decided to go to Congress. And so I think that just shows the value of this decision. Yeah, and it also, incidentally, even though it will go through, uh, or maybe already has, but the, it also prompted uh, France to actually take a vote uh, in, in Parliament on this action as well. And that's not likely to mm -hmm. be a problem passing there, but I think you're right. It definitely, starting with the UK, it's been a much more open debate. Do you think at this point that with Kerry kind of backing down well, well, actually, let me back up for a moment. It kind of opens up two different questions. So one is with Kerry backing down, and now you see Nancy Pelosi this morning uh, sending a letter to, to Democrats in Congress. There's a lot of work now on, it seems to me, what do you guys need, basically? How narrowly written does this need to be? How cautious is approach does this need to be to still get your vote and go through? So it seems like, are we moving to a, phase now where this is turning from, at least from a Democratic congressional point of view, and maybe also a Republican one, obviously, coming uh, from a different angle, from a real security, uh, human rights decision, whatever way you want to frame it, to a political, a political question for the Obama administration. Like, if we vote this down, if Democrats vote against this, this will be a huge embarrassment uh, if this doesn't go through Congress, so we need to ameliorate those conditions as much as we can, get something through, maybe take limited action, but we're already on to the question of political fallout and outside of 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 uh, what it is we may, the administration may or may not be trying to do in Syria. Um, yeah, I mean, I think sadly Washington is a deeply partisan place, and there's always been kind of this BS line about how foreign policy is a bipartisan venture. And right. That's uh, never really been true, and it's becoming even less true. But uh, I think that that would be a miscalculation that that uh, by members of Congress to view this as a as a political question. You know, David Cameron's government was certainly embarrassed by its vote in the parliament. But it wasn't brought down by this, and neither will be the Obama administration. Now, one of the one of the most consistent things about U.S. foreign policy has been that we are inconsistent. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, you know, I don't think it like uh, it, 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 it makes or breaks the Obama administration or its legacy or anything like that. Uh, but it certainly would be a little embarrassing, I think. Yeah, and and then is that kind of part of the calculus? Is the calculus shifting for them in that sense? That that the planning on the administration's part maybe is turning into a, how do we just not embarrass ourselves in Congress now as the kind of preeminent uh, focus? Uh, in in, in yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean, I think I think it has been to an extent the way you've seen Kerry, you know, being willing to accept Congress's changes to the authorization right. of the use of force, and as I said before, compromise thing on things like. Like uh, saying, listen, if you guys need us to come back to you for more authorizations, that's cool. Just give us this one. <laughs> but, you know, I, 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 that, that, there might be political motivations on the parts of, uh, of the Democrats who are taking part in that process so as to, you know, give the Obama administration something just to not be um, embarrassed. But at the same time, this is, this is kind of how the process is supposed to work, right? And it is in Congress, and it is a political process, no matter what people say about foreign policy. And, and so I think it's good that there's uh, there's compromise between these two co-equal branches of government. And uh, yeah, you know the, the motivations might not be that great, but the effect is still uh, that it that it you know it, it fits with our country's modus operandi of being uh, democracy, a representative democracy, and that's how these things are supposed to work. So I'm not that troubled by it, to be honest. No, absolutely. And and one would imagine that there would be a variety of policy areas that if there was more actual scrutiny and debate. Uh, the the policy formulation would be uh would probably be better 